When we're talking about documenting your work, I want to acknowledge that I've got a bit of a bias here. We're going to be focusing mostly on taking still photographs with a digital camera. There are other ways to document your work. If you create installations, it might be more appropriate for you to create videos of somebody moving through the space. New media artists might include video clips instead of still images. I'm working on the assumption that if that is appropriate for your work, you're working on those logistics while you're making the artwork. Feel free to contact me if you do have questions about how to format documenting your work in that way. Another disclaimer, it is crucial that you document your work well. Almost all of the people who are going to see your art aren't actually ever going to see your art. They're only going to see the images that you take of it. So many more people are going to have access to your website or your Instagram or the whatever they come up with next compared to the number of people who are actually physically going to be able to make it to the exhibition. So what are you going to need? Generally speaking, you want a camera, some filters that we'll talk about, a tripod or some other method by which you can hold the camera absolutely still, and then you want to have some lights. Where do we get these supplies? B&H Photo Supply is probably your best bet. It's what's always recommended to me whenever I talk to photo people about where I should get equipment. One thing I will note is that cameras, much like computers, will have new ones come out every season. They'll have different model years. They're coming up with fancy little edits that you and I don't care about for documenting our artwork. So we don't mind buying the slightly older model that's on sale Ideally, if you've got all the money in the world, you want a digital SLR. SLR stands for Single Lens Reflex. It's basically what's replaced an old 35mm camera. Probably your phone actually takes better pictures than the digital camera that I used when I first transitioned from 35mm film. I'm very old. But can you manipulate the settings in your phone? You want to be able to manipulate white balance and exposure and things like that. If you can do that in your phone, great. Don't buy a camera. If not, you probably want to get a digital SLR. Take advantage of the fact that you have resources on campus. Visit Anna in the Wold, it's room F109 in the main visual arts building, and you can check out pretty much everything that we're talking about. Once you have your camera, you want to make sure that the lens is not distorting or bowing the image. The best method I've come up with to make sure that you're getting everything straight is to take a picture of graph paper. Set up graph paper in place of one of your artworks and photograph it while changing the settings on your lens. Once you find one that doesn't bow any of the lines, top, sides, or bottom, that's the setting that you're going to want to use. It might be worth it to mark on your lens with a Sharpie exactly where you are setting the lens to not get bowing. This is also why you want to be able to set things manually. The autofocus on your camera is likely to change the length of the lens as part of trying to focus. Get a polarizing filter. You're looking for a circular filter that screws onto the end of your camera. It's going to be two pieces of glass that you can twist and that will help to reduce glare. Also available are polarizing filter sheets, large plastic sheets that you clamp over your lamps. These are pretty expensive. Most of us are going to be able to get by with a polarizing filter on the camera, but it does depend on the texture of your artwork. If you make high gloss ceramics, there's a chance that that shine is something that you're going to need to manipulate at the light source. For your tripod, get something simple and stable. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't need it to have levels and built-in stabilizers and jetpacks and whatnot. You just want something that is going to make sure that the camera doesn't move when you have to take a really long exposure. One of the things that you're likely to be doing in manual settings is having a pretty small aperture. So your f-stop is going to be a really high number like 16 or 22, which means not a lot of light is coming into the camera. To balance that out, you're going to have to have a really long exposure time, and you don't want the camera to shake at all. You can reduce this also by using a cable or a timer, or many cameras these days will come with a little remote. You've got to make sure that your camera is parallel and perpendicular to the artwork. It's really easy to have it tilted just slightly. You might have to actually measure from the body of the camera to the artwork 
to make sure that everything is perfectly level. If you're shooting in your own studio or in a place that you can come back to repeatedly, it might be worth it to put tape marks on the floor so that you know exactly where you want to set things. For lights, controlled and consistent is more important than anything else. You want to be able to predict exactly how much light you're getting. Sometimes artists are told to photograph their work outside on a cloudy day, which is a great idea as long as you're able to get the sun to do exactly what you want whenever you want. I think it's probably easier for you to just go ahead and get some clamp lights. Eventually getting photo lights, things that have filters or umbrellas, would be great, but starting with clamp lights is totally fine. If you're worried that the bulb that you have to use to get enough light is too hot, by which I mean literally too hot, it'll melt the plastic in the clamp lights, at the hardware store you can buy a ceramic socket for a couple of bucks that will keep you from starting a fire. You want to make sure that you are cross-lighting with at least two lamps. If you are photographing three-dimensional work, it's even better to have three so that you can create interesting shadows, but make sure that you're backfilling so that you don't have dominant shadows. For 2D work, you're going to set your two lights at 45 degrees angled from the artwork. You might have to pull them back pretty far to make sure that the beam of the light is larger than the artwork, especially where it overlaps. If we are cross-lighting, what we're doing is taking the lamp on the right and aiming it at the left-hand side of the artwork. Similarly, we're going to take the left-hand light and aim it at the right side of the artwork. Think about what you would do if you were creating a Venn diagram. Ideally, that overlap is still larger than the artwork itself. You want to make sure that you avoid hot spots or dark corners, and you need to be aware of the color temperature. Your camera is much more sensitive to this than your eye. It will really change if you're using tungsten versus daylight bulbs, or if you're using fluorescence instead. You can set the white balance in almost all cameras. Read through the manual that came with your camera. Just take a picture of a blank piece of paper or a gessoed canvas and tell the camera that is white in this day and this lighting situation. Don't just rely on being able to change this in Photoshop. You want to get it right in the camera. You don't need a separate light meter, but you do need to understand how the light meter in your camera actually works. It is going to give you a reading for a combination of an f-stop, how much light comes in, and an exposure, how long light is coming into the camera. You also need to know that the camera is trying to give you a combination that will turn whatever the middle of its viewfinder is seeing into a neutral gray. Your artwork is probably not a neutral gray, so you need to be able to adjust this. The easiest way to do that is by bracketing. Taking some images that are deliberately over or underexposed, often your camera will automate this so that you can just push the button once and take three or five exposures at different settings. You might also use a piece of white tape so that when you're using Photoshop or other color correction software, you've got a white that you can compare things to. It could be really tedious to set everything up, and eventually you'll be tempted to say, I'll fix it in Photoshop. Don't do that. Get it right in the camera. Take a good exposure with good lighting with good color, and then fix it in Photoshop.